Greetings and welcome back. So, what do I have to say here? This is this is honestly one of my favorite vignettes, if you'll let me use that word. It reflects, I think, the the sentiment that still most strongly drives me, and and also I feel like is the one of the biggest missing things in the world of uh, education. So. Let's we'll start with this video. We'll just watch it together in silence. Well, I could sit and watch that all day long, and actually have. As I say at the top, it all begins with the two simple words, I wonder. And in seeing a video like this, there's so much to wonder. So I'm not going to talk about it right now, but I will talk about it later in the course. This is reminiscent of a very important topic from classical mechanics. In the 1880s, I think, Heinrich Hertz who was a great scientist who maybe some of you haven't heard of. He, like Saadi Carnot, died at the age of 36, you know, very young. But he was uh, a theoretician, really, although he did the experiments that confirmed Maxwell's theory. And one of the things that was very interesting about his work is that he solved the problem of contact mechanics. And what I mean by that is if you take a sphere and you push it on a surface, it will deform the surface. Probably the easiest way to think about that is like in the case of jello. So if I take a piece of jello and I push my finger on that piece of jello, what will happen is it will deform. And what Hertz figured out was what the displacement field was everywhere beneath the indenter. And the reason I bring that up is that that's a, that's a problem that using a classical theory of elasticity, we know how to solve very well. There's a whole book about it by Ken Johnson called Contact Mechanics, which I encourage you to take a look at. And the thing I'm saying here when in looking at this case of a predator in or engaging with a, a school of fish is that that leads to an in indentation as well. But from the standpoint of active matter, meaning the school of fish, we really don't know how to think about the, this indentation problem. So, you know, I wonder what sets the scale of the size of the greenness around the sea lion? Why did the fish froth at that one particular instant? How deep does the indentation go? You know, there's all these things that we could ask that are of a quantitative character. And I have to say, you know, one of the points of this course is that a qualitative understanding is insufficient. In other words, I would not be satisfied by saying, oh, when the, when the sea lion perturbs the school of fish, the school of fish is deformed. That's not good enough for me. I want to actually understand the size of the indentation and the dynamics of it and so on. Anyway, so that's, that's I wonder number one. Uh, I wonder number two. I wonder what underlying principles dictate the shape of sheep herds. And we're going to talk about this in some detail in this course using the theory of John Toner and Yuhai Tu, which is really one of my favorite things that I've learned about in the last few years, and uh, with my, my book co-author Christina Heeshin. And and, you know, you, the way she likes to pose this question is, you know, if you were to have a bunch of robotic sheep, how would you program them to elicit this kind of beautiful dynamics, especially the part of them moving through this orifice, you know, this little hole, which is a is basically a gate in a fence. Just look at that. You know, look at look at the back of it. There's so much to wonder about. And, you know, you see these reversals of motion and and vorticity arising and reflection off of the barrier and you know just beautiful things to think about and i believe in some ways that you know this is a theme that i'm going to bring up again and again it's probably going to be annoying i'm sure it's annoying to people who know me well because i say it all the time but i just feel that poetry and science they're adult ways of not taking things for granted of remembering you know, to honor the cliche of smelling the roses, you know, to notice things and not taking them for granted. One of my favorite stories, again, you know, I've told it many times and 
um, it's tiring for those that have heard it, but I, I never tire of it is, you know, I always choose a right hand window seat when I'm flying back from Europe because I want to look at Greenland. And I marvel in a way at all the people that sit there with their shades down, uh, you know, flying at nearly the speed of sound in an aluminum tube. And they're five miles up in the air and they can look down and see the Bergschrins of the glacier. They can see the confluence of different glaciers in Greenland. Who wouldn't want to watch that? And yet, you know, either people are watching their movie or sleeping or, or whatever. So I'm just saying, you know, I wonder, let's not take things for granted. Another thing that I wonder about is how birds navigate over 10,000 kilometer distances. Here on the lower left, I show you uh, an image of the bar-tailed godwit. Um, these birds, they migrate between Alaska, as you see in the top of the figure on the right, and New Zealand. And uh, in this article, which I highly encourage you to take a look at, they instrumented up uh, nine bar-tailed godwits. I think it was six females and three males. The females that was implanted, um, the, the device was implanted, and, and if I remember correctly for the males, they basically wore a belt. And interestingly, the, the, the modification to the drag for the males resulted in them not being able to fly quite as far, you know, showing you that these little tiny differences in drag over this long distance can actually be substantive. Um, but at any rate, you know, you could work out what kind of angular error would be tolerated in getting from Alaska to New Zealand. And, you know, having myself been out at sea for three months on a sailboat and, you know, used a sextant to navigate, no kidding, you know, it's before the era of G GPS. What I can tell you is when we would do things like the, the method of dead reckoning, which is basically vector analysis, you know your compass heading, you know your speed using a device called a Tafrail log, and you just draw a straight line, which is an interpolation of how, what you think your new position is, we would sometimes be, after 24 hours, 100 miles off course because of currents in the ocean. And so, you know, there's similar things going on with the wind. So it just, I don't know, I'm asking you to stop for a moment and just ask yourselves, you know, are you satisfied just knowing that a bird, a little tiny bird like that one shown on the left, like this big can I got to see, see them uh, in a lagoon uh, in on the South Island of New Zealand just you now frolicking on the sand but are you satisfied that you understand how they navigate I mean even if I told you oh yeah they use magnetism in some way even then as I just pointed out you know we on a ship going along the coast of Baja, we followed a compass and we would be 100 miles off course after 24 hours. So it's not very obvious to me anyway. I mean, I'm slow. So, you know, maybe, maybe there'll be people that will listen to this and say, yeah, no, I get it. And, you know, kudos to you, but I don't. <laughs> so I wonder about it. I wonder why mathematics seems to work so well at describing the natural world. You know, Galileo was so impressed as he thought about things like falling bodies and projectile motion that he made this remark, the universe cannot be read until we have learnt the language and become familiar with the characters in which it is written. It is written in mathematical language and the letters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. So mathematics is so incredibly powerful. I think Newton was the first to see this like in such a glorious and enormous way. As you see in the middle figure, what he did is he had this insight that the projectile motion of Galileo and the elliptical motions of Kepler, who was thinking about planetary motion, that those two things are different sides of the same coin, meaning gravitational physics. And so, you know, he used mathematics in the form of triangles, as you see on the right, I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, in a very beautiful way to prove Kepler's law about equal areas being swept out in equal times. You know, I think Darwin appreciated this in his autobiography, he, he made the remark, in after years, I've deeply regretted that I did not proceed far enough at least to understand something of the great leading principles of mathematics, for those thus endowed seem to have an extra sense. And for sure, that's one of the messages of this course. This is a course about that extra sense. It's about, it's not trying to say that this is better. We, anybody that knows a little bit about the history of biology should realize it's crystal clear. You know, the biologists have done amazing, insightful, beautiful, profound things 
to understand the living world in the absence of mathematics. You know, like there, there's no requirement. I'm saying, you know, there's there's other tools, and one of them is mathematics and physics, and that's what I want to celebrate in this course. That's that's the thing that gets me going personally. That is the criterion that I bring to the table for myself about what it means to understand something. And, you know, I highly recommend that you take a look at this article by Eugene Wigner, who was a very famous physicist and kind of mathematician. You know, um, he wrote a beautiful book on group theory. Um, he wrote this article in the early 60s called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. I think nobody would argue that that in physics, mathematics has this great, profound in, impact. I think that, you know, the same is already true in biology. Um, and what I mean by that is that although people may still be debating whether it's necessary, I think that that debate is a uh, fool's errand because I think that it's already a done deal. That, you know, the use of mathematics is profoundly important. In fact, uh, just today, you know, one of my true scientific heroes and dare I say, actually personal friend, Howard Berg, um, died this morning in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he and Purcell, you know, wrote down this really wonderful theory that had to do with accuracy in measurement, in the sense that, you know, a chemotaxing bacterium, it wants to measure very small gradients in concentration, and then the question is, you know, how long a measurement do you need to make in order to be able to resolve a certain delta C, where I'm using C as the variable for concentration. Okay, new question. I wonder how in humans and other animals, leg length is nearly perfectly equal. Just think about that. So, you know, before I went for a swim this morning, I took a picture of my, my legs, and I think about it all the time. Here you have these two entities, they're growing, you know. When I was 13 or 14, I think there were years, you know, I remember actually my bones kind of aching when I would grow six inches, you know, in one year, um, you know, to my current 6'2 or whatever. And you kind of got to wonder, um, how does it work? How, do, how what is, what's up with that? Wallace Marshall and Joel Rosenbaum and, and others have done these amazing experiments in the context of Chlamydomonas, where this is an organism that has two flagella. And if you sever one of the two flagella, then what will happen is the longer one that wasn't sh sh uh, severed will shorten until it's the same length as the one that was severed, and then the two of them will grow back to the correct length. You know, again, what's up with that? I wonder. I suppose my favorite episode, if I'm being honest, I think my favorite episode in the entire history of life, it's a big claim, but I don't think it's hyperbole. It dictates my travel and things like that, is the, the evolution of whales. So I learned about this originally from Carl Zimmer in his book, I think it's called At the Water's Edge, which is about limbs to fins and fins to limbs transitions. Fins to limbs was the first of those two um, in the Devonian 380 million years ago. And then the, the whale evolution was post uh, extinction of dinosaurs. And, you know, this is a, a case study of really of profound and interesting features. And, you know, the question I guess I want to ask is what sets the time scale? How is it that over, let's say, 15 to 20 million years, you go from land animals that maybe were the size of a little bigger than my hand or something to animals that were, you know, on the order of 10 meters in size with all sorts of weirdnesses, you know, like at some point, as you can see, if you look at Rhodocetus, uh, Ambulocetus, you'll see that they still have legs. And by the time you get to Doriodon and uh, Bacillosaurus, I think, you know, you have vestigial limbs, so the legs are in, in the process of going away. And I guess I am just asking this question of what is it that sets the time scale for such evolution? You know, my friend Daniel Fisher likes to remark, and I think rightly so, that 
uh, if the physicists and the geologists were wrong again, let's say the physicists, because that was really Kelvin's deal, where he made claims about the age of the Earth, which were misguided, even though they were good science, Say we're wrong again by a factor of two in either direction. Do we know enough about evolution to actually care? And I think that Daniel's conjecture here is correct. I think we don't. You know, I don't know how to know a priori that in a, on a 10 million year time scale, you know, that you will, you can and will get whales. Um, our cur current understanding of the diversity of whales is probably something I'll come back to later in the term, but. You know, there's, there's a lot known. It's a very rich and interesting fossil record, and it's a very interesting DNA story. And the reconciliation of those two things is especially beautiful because, you know, we have fossils of whales, and so we can learn things about their teeth, you know, and the loss of enamel. There's a gene for enamelin, and it becomes a pseudogene in the sense that it's populated by stop codons and things like that because it's no, no longer necessary. And so we can reconcile our understanding of the fossil record with our understanding of what's going on at the level of DNA. I wonder what whales are saying. You know, I really wonder that. that's another one we could sit and watch all day. One of the things about the history of science that intrigues me, maybe I'll say two things. One of them is the humanocentric, the yeah, humanocentric view of the world that we perpetuate over and over and over again. You know, it's just kind of endless the number of times where we somehow can't escape the confines of our own self-importance, you know, which, you know, we're important to ourselves, there's no doubt about it, but, you know, whether it was the geocentric notion of the solar system or universe more generally, uh, now I'll frame a hypothesis, you know, you're welcome to disagree with me, in fact, I'm not going to say who, but one of my dearest friends and book co-authors, um, not of PBOC, he and I have had this debate about the specialness or lack thereof of human beings. And so my hypothesis is, I think it's really, really a conceit of humans to imagine that, you know, because we actually build cities and stuff, that that implies that we're like singularly unique. And there's a, there's a couple of really interesting women scientists. There's a film, I forgot what it's called, unfortunately. I think it's maybe called Fathom. And both of them are, are interested in whale language and whale song. And one of them works in Alaska, the other works in New Zealand. And, and one of the, the two women, she, I think she's from Scotland, if I remember correctly, she basically was tracking the, over time, the propagation of a whale song from New Zealand north and then over to the east, if I remember this correctly. And, the reason I think it's amazing is she makes this claim that, you know, whales have had culture way longer than there have even been human beings. And they have a culture of song and communication. The other, the other woman, she actually uses microphones and she's, she's trying to decipher the language of whales. Anyway, I'm just saying, I wonder what whales are saying and I think it's absurd. Again, that's me, it's subjective, but I really honestly think it's absurd that, uh, anyone would have the hypothesis that the only animals on planet Earth with language are us. Yeah, don't buy that. I wonder how socks before shoes kinetics is orchestrated in biological systems. This is very important. It's going to be one of the main themes of the course. This is really Julie Terrio's idea 
And the point is, you know, the, the thing that she likes to say, and I, I really would second her, and Jeremy Guna Wardena also has a really nice way of thinking about this, is that if we have socks and feet and shoes, and we're in equilibrium, then there's going to be an equilibrium constant telling me how many foot socks there are, how many foot shoes there are going to be, how many sock shoe dimers, how many foot, foot sock shoe trimers, how many shoe monomers, etc. To get the situation at the bottom, which is, you know, feet plus socks goes to a sock foot dimer, and then that dimer plus shoe goes to a sock foot shoe trimer, that unidirectional arrow implies the expenditure of energy. You, you cannot have that in an equilibrium sense. And so, you know, what, I, what I'm showing you here, oops, um, in this video, is chromosome segregation. And, you know, in, as, as we watch it, I think the, the key point is just to notice this orchestration in space and time. There's a time ordering. And so my wondering, you know, it's fine to name the molecules and talk about microtubules and kinesin and kinetic cores and all that. It's awesome. That's not sufficient for me. So socks before shoes. I guess this is one of my favorite ones, and, and in a way is like a, a warning shot across the bow for biophysics, in a way. And that's uh, maybe best illustrated by the case of sickle cell. So in the upper left, you know, I show you the DNA double helix, and part of the reason I show you that, note that the DNA in the, the ball figure the radius of DNA is one nanometer, and the distance between adjacent base pairs in the stacking direction is a third of a nanometer. So using pi r squared h, pi is pi, so that's three. r squared is one nanometer squared, and then h is one third of a nanometer. So I get pi over one third, or times one third, and that ends up giving me one. So one nanometer cubed per base pair. Cool. And so what I'm going to make, and what I'm going to say is that if you take the wild type hemoglobin sequence shown at the bottom, you'll get a glutamic acid at a particular position, and a single base pair mutation suffices. And what I'm saying is like that's a one third nanometer scale uh, rearrangement of something in an organism, a molecular scale event, leads to macroscopic consequences for a two meter tall organism, meaning sickle cell anemia, which could kill that person or could cause them great pain. So you could have a human being at my scale writhing in pain because of a single, it's almost like saying, well, you know, I changed a, a two, K, three KBT energy scale bonding arrangement in one molecule of DNA and the consequence propagates all the way to the scale of this enormous organism. So yeah, I find that to be, you know, really interesting. How do these single base pair changes propagate to the one meter scale? I wonder what is setting all the time scales in the COVID pandemic. You know, there down here at the bottom, you see uh, Omicron. It's our latest uh, annoying fact, which is why I'm doing these, these uh, vignettes online. So this is from the Next uh, Strain website, which is really you know, an amazing resource for all of us. And you know, you can, you can sit here and look at the evolution in real time of COVID. And I'm just saying, just like I did for evolution of whales, I don't myself, you know, maybe there are people that claim that they understand, or maybe they, it's more than a claim, maybe they do understand it. I personally don't understand really the time scales for fixation of uh, mutations and so on. I mean, this gives you a sense, if you look at the y-axis on the left, the number of mutations since the original strains a couple years ago is on the order of 40 or something like that. Um, we'll probably do this calculation, but I find it amusing. You know, there are 20 million people roughly infected today with COVID and the number of viruses per person allows us to estimate that every night, you know, between today and tomorrow, there will be 20 million, if I remember my estimate correctly, 20 million mutations at each site in the 30,000 nucleotide long genome of, of SARS-CoV-2. 
it's an amazing thing you know like there's so much mutational clay to sculpt every day in that sense it kind of surprises me that the the rate of evolution is not faster in the sense of you know us having more waves of uh of different variants I don't know, maybe this will seem stupid to you, but I wonder how bugs find me so quickly when I'm mountain biking uphill. So I've kind of tested this a little bit. You know, I like to ride my bike up in the mountains and um, not at this time of year, especially on a rainy day like today. But, you know, when summer comes around, um, it's very interesting. You know, I like to ride uphill. I'm not very interested in flats on fire roads. And, you know, after five minutes, I'm completely surrounded by bugs and I can I can do this, or if I hit a flat, I can ride faster and I'll lose them, and then they'll find me again. And so that just, it raises all sorts of questions for me. And I, I imagine there are people, even uh, like Michael Dickinson at Caltech has done experiments, I think up towards Mono La Lake or somewhere where they release flies and they have a source of f food, Drosophila, and then they, they can kind of track uh, these flies. Um, and they can find things, or the food over long distances. Lots of things to wonder about. You know, like what's the mean density of bugs that are flying around, and then how do they, what are they detecting, and how do they detect it, with what sensitivity, what kind of a gradient is there around me, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Very cool and interesting. I wonder how we can describe the wildebeest herds using mathematics. So this kind of touches on the same thing as the, the sea lion, what I'll call the sea lion green function. So, you know, it's a, it's a great curiosity to me that you know, in the night, about 100 years ago, what was known in the Serengeti is that there were lots of big lions, male lions with uh, dark manes. So Westerners came to hunt on the Serengeti. People noticed that the wildebeest would come and go, but they didn't know that they were engaged in, a, in actually in a migration. It was only in the late 1950s that a father and son pair um, used airplanes and so on to actually track and count the, the wildebeest. I wonder what set the time scale for eradication of rinderpest after vaccination. So, you know, we're living in this worldwide pandemic right now, and there was another such pandemic, uh, which was brought to Africa in the 1890s. I think it was cows brought from India, and they harbored this uh, virus called rinderpest. It's super interesting because, you know, we lack imagination. Earlier I said there's two things um, that, I, that I guess I, I learned, and I only told you one of them. Um, the other one was our lack of imagination, and that's not a criticism. It's just saying it's just hard for us to, you know, I think it was Horatio in a Shakespeare play, there's more, more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in our philosophy. It's just our imaginations. We tend to be humanocentric, but we also have bad imaginations. You know, people thought that heat was a fluid. People thought that there was an ether. People thought that the earth was at the center. Lamarck had this beautiful but wrong idea about evolution. Go, we could go on and on and on with all the, the wrong ideas because of, maybe because of our lack of imagination. So the original notion was that the cows died because the wildebeest were carrying some infectious agent. And this led to a huge human consequence, like 95% of the cows died and all sorts of people died of starvation. It was really terrible. And yet the science was exact, exactly backwards. The cows were the carriers and they're the ones who infected the wildebeest. And what you see in this figure is the proportion of wildebeest harboring antibodies against the, um, against the rinderpest basically went to zero once the vaccination program began only on the cows. There was no vaccination on wildebeest, but the cows were vaccinated and shortly thereafter, the wildebeest no longer harbored antibodies against rinderpest. So I wonder what set the time scale for eradication. Um, this is just, this is the father and son uh, pair. I'm leaning over so you can see their names, Bernard and Michael Grzmeck. They wrote a book um, and they counted the wildebeest population. I just think, you know, this is another great I wonder question, which is what set the time scale for the reemergence of the population to its wild type value in the absence of rinderpest? Why is it so stable? What sets the 1.3 million uh, scale, et, et cetera? Uh, I wonder what genomes are telling us. I really wonder that. You know, what are genomes trying to tell us? And, you know, this is a, a bit of a sequence from E. coli that, you know, until very recently we didn't know what it meant. And 
I would just say we have this great book of nature, which is, uh, I, I kiddingly refer to as the genomic encyclopedia. And the only part of it that I would claim we have mastery over, largely, but even then it's, it's, not, it's imperfect, is the protein coding regions. So we know how to dissect those. We have this huge thirst for more sequence. You know, as of today, there are roughly 10 to the 17th nucleotides deposited on the NIH, I think it's called SRA uh, database. If you work it out, you know, this is some crazy number. It's like 150 billion copies of Shakespeare or something like that. Um, it's a lot of sequence information. And yet, you know, we, we can understand the protein coding regions. At least we can understand what the sequence of amino acids is. But by way of contrast, there are parts, in particular the part I'm referring to is the, the uh, regulatory parts of genomes where we don't know what's going on. And so... You know, I would like to say, I wonder what's going on with the regulatory parts of genomes. So I think of that as the genomic Rosetta Stone. So there's, uh, in uh, 20, 2005, there was, it was the 100th anniversary of the big year that Einstein had in, in 1905, and many people were opining about what had been accomplished over that 100-year period, and David Merman, uh, at Cornell had this, he, he wrote this article, which I love, what I'd like to know about 2105. And he wants us to imagine that like Rip Van Winkle, you know, you go to sleep today and you wake up in 2105. And his question was, you know, what would be 10 questions scientifically that you would like to know the answer to at that point? And he said, you know, people that attempted to answer these kinds of questions were very provincial. They were asking questions that had like a 10-year time scale to them rather than a 100-year time scale. And Merman attempted to come up with questions that were meaningful on a 100-year time scale. Because again, our imaginations are really challenged. Like just to give you one example, he said, you know, what would be a device that you use in 2105 that would be as bizarre and as crazy to me as is the laptop that I'm doing this lecture on. I mean, look at me. I'm sitting here, you know, not talking to any of you. I'm recording this. I'm by myself. There's a picture of me on the screen that I can see myself. I, I put together these slides. They're sitting on a computer. You know, I didn't even have hard copies of any of this stuff. None of it. It doesn't exist as a hard copy. And I'm talking and recording this and I'm going to put it on YouTube and somebody else can watch it in 10 years from now or something like that. So what would be a device uh, of that character? And for me, what I'd like to know in 2105 is what's the status of our understanding of driven out of equilibrium systems with living organisms being the paramount example. And what I would say is that thermodynamics got off to this great start. You know, it's got this nice name, thermodynamics. It turns out, you know, it, yeah, it got a great start. So, for example, Carnot had this notion of abstracting and simplifying and idealizing heat engines to the effect that all those complicated diagrams that you see on the left could be superseded by what you see in the center at the bottom, which is the abstraction of the so-called Carnot cycle. And then on the right, Clausius had these ideas about heat being the result of microscopic motions of molecules and, and so on. But in the end, you know, thermodynamics fell short despite this beautiful insight of um, Gibbs, who basically wrote down variational mathematics that told us how to do a derivative and set a derivative equal to zero to find the terminal privileged state, the so-called equilibrium state of a system. That's, that's truly absolutely stunning, and I love it. It's, it's really you know, one of the pinnacles of my education, my life in science, my joy in the discoveries that have been made by scientists. I think it's truly amazing, and yet it's thermostatics, it's not thermodynamics. And, you know, we have, we have little steps, tiny steps for tiny feet, which allow us to think about phenomenological laws that relate flux to degree of disequilibrium, which here I label as driving force. So for example, I will have a flux of molecules if I have a concentration gradient. I will have a flux of heat if I have a temperature gradient and so on. But that, that's very limited in its scope, albeit very powerful and insightful. So there's this great comment from, uh, from Julien Taller 
who says saying non-equilibrium physics is like saying non-elephant biology. I think that's very meaningful. Uh, he's, he's channeling Stan Ulam, who said using a term like nonlinear science is like referring to the bulk of zoology as a study of non-elephant animals. You know, it's good. It's good for us to be reminded of this. Like the world is all is flux. Everything is changing all the time. And so my proposition or my question for 2105 is by then will we have either figured out some sort of unifying principles that make it so that each new non-equilibrium problem is not an adventure unto itself? Or will we have learned that, yeah, each non-equilibrium problem is an adventure unto itself and we're going to fall short in terms of general principles? I don't know the answer to that. I would like to know the answer to that. I certainly am hedging my bets, or I should say I'm betting in my own career, my own research directions, that there will be general principles. And I indeed hope that there are that have kind of this Gibbsian character. So at the end, you know, what I wonder is how to link the dichotomy between unity and diversity as we study living matter. Yes, the diversity of the living world, whether it's the blue whale shown in the lower left or the, the giant redwoods, sequoias and so on shown in the lower right, with the general principles such as the unity of biochemistry in the form of the genetic code or the unity of biochemistry in the form of glycolysis and the use of ATP and so on, or overarching principles such as error correction and so on, you know, how do we think about the linkage between those things and how will that alter on the 50 year time scale the teaching of the life sciences? Because again, I, I look forward to a day, I hope for a day when we will no longer think of, of biology as being a subject in which you know, we, for a whole undergrad education, can largely ignore all the great insights of mathematics from the last 400 years. So just to, you know, to close this vignette, I wonder, I wonder, and hopefully you do too. Thing of great beauty.